Yanni has a God who knows all things, created all things, and sees all things, can still love me. How a father would so willingly welcome me, his child, after things that I've done against him. I came into this world a sinner, covered by darkness, buried in guilt. I lied, cheated, turned from God, and was apathetic to his will. But even knowing all of that, God sent his son. Jesus rescued me, cleansed me, healed me. His forgiveness is here, ready to break these chains that keep me from his grace. He wraps me in his arms and comforts me. He gives me what only the God of the universe can give, love, hope, joy, peace. I have found freedom in God and I choose to step into his promises every day, free from guilt, secure in the knowledge of Christ. Amen. Praise God for stories of redemption and freedom. Our sin is great, but his grace is greater still. Hey, it's an honor to be here with you this morning at the Sugar Land Campus. My name is Libin Abraham, and I have the great joy and just honor of serving at our Siena Campus at our, as our campus pastor there. And we're so thankful to be there. It's thankful that God has let Stacy and I just be a part of a church in multiple locations reaching our city, and so I'm honored to be here. And as you realize, I am not Pastor Mark. I know I look like him, um, but he is actually preaching in Siena live today. Usually we get to have him on video, and, and we stream the 930 service, And um, but he is in person today, so you have me. I'm sorry. I know you're disappointed. Uh, hey, it's also an honor to have my parents and my siblings here with me, all over from Tennessee and Dallas, and I thank God for them. Just wanted to honor them for their life and their prayers. In the last two weeks, or two weeks ago, we started a new series in the book of 1 John called Know That You Know. I've got a lot of great friends of mine who are different faith religions and systems, and I've asked friends, uh, leaders, gurus, imams, all kinds of people, hey, how do you know that you're saved? How do you know that you have eternal life and the forgiveness of their sin? And every one of them has quoted me verbatim the same answer. We can never know for sure, but only hope so. We can never know for sure, but only hope so. And you've got to think, that's got to be a weight on your shoulder. That's got to be a sense of, wow, isn't that pressure, anxiety, knowing that the last day of your life you could blow it all up and disrupt your destiny and have no salvation at all. But we know that we know. First John chapter 5, John gives us this purpose statement while he's writing to us in this letter. And he says in verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. You don't have to doubt it. You don't have to wonder. You don't have to try to figure it all out. You know, we know that because of Jesus, we have eternal life. And two weeks ago, we started, and how do you know? What's the foundation of our faith? What's the starting place, the ending place? And it all starts and ends with Jesus. John goes right at chapter 1 of, look, if we get Jesus right, we have fellowship with God. The one who has appeared to us, the one who has been forever from the beginning and now has appeared to us in flesh. We've touched him. We've felt him. We have been around him. And he is the only means to faith. Our Belief doesn't revolve around systems or philosophy. It revolves around a person and an event where the earth shook and the roll and the stone was rolled away and sin and death was forever defeated. This morning we're going to continue discovering what this fellowship looks like and what does it mean to be in fellowship with God. I don't know about you, but I've made some mistakes in life, uh, done some things that I wish I hadn't done, said some words I wish I could just take back. Do you ever wish you had a little undo button on your life? Anybody, yeah? You got on your laptops, right? You got on your phone and you text, oh, I can undo, and it just erases it. Oh, we all wish we had a chance to do some things over, take words back, actions back, and as if it would be erased from history and our memory. But it doesn't happen that way. And anytime we do something that we know we shouldn't, say something we know we shouldn't, eat something we know we shouldn't, and can't hit an undo button, Something finds us out before our parents find us, before our spouse finds us out, before even our own excuses find us out. A five-little word, a five-letter word, guilt. Guilt. I think everyone in this room who wishes for an undo button would do so because of some kind of guilt or regret or remorse after something was done. Guilt is the emotional state of mind 
when we have failed to do what we know is right. When we failed, we missed the mark on what we know for sure. It's not because we didn't know better. It's because we knew better, and so we didn't do it. That's guilt. It's when our actions and our beliefs are not matching. We believe one thing, but we act a different way. And when we do that, guilt happens. We know we should eat healthy and work out. But when the last time you ate that Dunkin' Donut, chocolate-covered, sprinkled on your third one, you start feeling a little guilty, right? We know we should do that, but we didn't do it. Unfortunately, guilt has anchored so many people into a lifelong feeling of guilt. It sort of paralyzes you from the future. It holds you back from seeing your future opportunities or present privileges you've been given. It anchors you back. It paralyzes you. And medical reports tell us that over 50% of patients who are in hospitals suffer mental issues. And most of those things stem from simply guilt, and it expresses itself in depression, suicidal thoughts, or marriage issues, or alcohol, substance abuse, or whatever it might be. Guilt can really anchor us in. It's become a root of life. Even if you're not a believer and you don't know Jesus or you haven't been around church, you still feel something wrong when you do something that you know you shouldn't do. You can try to drink it away, medicate it away, throw some money at it, have more kids, have a bigger, busier life, but still when it's just you and you at night, Laying in your bed, there's just a feeling of something's off. There was a, um, a recently a website that was hacked into and leaked. Very unfortunately, thousands of names were found out. People who were in married relationships and had extramarital affairs. A relationship, maybe signed up for one or had one. Devastating. But the most devastating thing was many who were found out couldn't handle the shame of it and several pastors and leaders teachers committed suicide because they couldn't live in the guilt it it sort of bound them up so much it was a chain that was around their life because what guilt makes something we have done something we are it takes an identity and transports it into it takes an act and transports it into an identity It's not just something we've done. It's not who we are. We live under that banner. We live under that shame, and forever we are chained by it. But do you have to be changed? Is there a way out? The greatest tragedy of guilt is that it hinders this fellowship with the Father. It hinders our walk with Jesus. It hinders our intimacy with God himself. And I assure you this morning, there is a way out. You don't have to live under the shame and the banner of guilt any longer. And it's beautiful when you find out what it is. John in 1 John chapter 1 goes to the very heart of guilt. He addresses to us the problem, the the source of where guilt comes from before he gives us a solution. See, guilt can't come from just mistakes that we make and move on. Mistakes can be corrected. It can be erased from our memory. You make a mistake as a kid or as a student and you just kind of correct it and move on. Maybe because mistakes happen with a lack of information or a misunderstanding of information. And so we make mistakes and move on. There's that sense of guilt. There's not as much sense of guilt, at least, or consequences associated with that because we can move on. So guilt has to come something from much deeper that impacts, affects our whole person and really our whole life. Maybe your guilt is associated with a weekend, a person, a name, a city. And anytime you hear that name, see that person, drive through that city, or around that time of the year, man, you start feeling that exact same sense of remorse and guilt, and it rushes back into you. What's the source of all of this? First John chapter 1, John says it like this in verse 5 to 6. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. John sets up here a contrast between darkness and light. Darkness represents sin and light, its absence, representing its absence. God is light, no darkness in him. Intellectually, light represents truth. Physically, light represents glory. Morally, light represents holiness, purity. God is light. Light, not like a light, he is light. He is a fullness of truth, fullness of glory, majesty, perfection, fullness of splendor and holiness. There is nothing that is faulty, nothing that is immoral, nothing that is impure, nothing that is unjust. He is always faithful. 
And if you're searching for that kind of a person, you can only find that in God. We were made in that image. When God created us, he made us in his image and in his likeness. Meaning that he put the imprint of his beauty and his perfection upon us. We too were created in that walk of light and life with him. We were created with a perfect relationship with God. A fellowship with him. We were created with a perfect relationship with one another. Even in ourselves, there was a unison. There was a, there was a sense of purity and with nature. Nothing was wrong. Except that we were prone to darkness. And when sin crept in, we embraced it. We actually liked it. We loved it. And because there is no darkness in God, we were far from God. And the further we became, the darker we became. And so distant that John says, when he writes about Jesus, look, light has come, but we love darkness too much to recognize it. Jesus himself says that I am a light that's been sent to you so that if you believe in me, you no longer have to live in darkness. God's great goal through Jesus and through the Holy Spirit is to bring us back into a walk, into a fellowship with the glory, the beauty, the perfection of God. That's why it says in 1 John 2, 1, my little children, I am writing these things, things to you so that you may not sin. Jesus himself in Matthew 5, 48 says, therefore you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. What they're saying is come back in the light, live in the light and the fellowship, the intimacy, the beauty of his perfection. So where does sin come from? Sin, I'm sorry, where does guilt come from? Guilt does not come from mistakes that can be corrected. It comes from sin that has to be paid for. Say that again. Guilt does not come from mistakes that can be corrected. It comes from sin that has to be corrected. So sin is defined one way as missing the mark, the act of missing the mark. It's an archery term where you have a bow and an arrow and you shoot at a goal and you completely miss it. Well, I don't have a bow and an arrow, but I've got two books. And let's say that table is the perfection, the beauty, the truth, the holiness of God. And we are to live in that perfection, in that sinless state. And all that we do, we can strive, boom, miss the mark. You try harder, you try to do better, go to church more, memorize more verses, sing more songs. Might have gone close. Which of these books missed the mark? Both of them. It doesn't matter how far you've missed the mark, we have missed the mark. All of us in this room have missed the mark of God's glory and perfection. And that's where guilt comes from. When we miss the mark of God's standard, not ours, but God's standard of right and wrong, we sin. And if our hearts are in tune with him or the Holy Spirit convicts us, we, we are faced with guilt and pain and loss in our life. Even if you're here and you've never been to church, you didn't grow up in Sunday school, you still feel a sense of, I've blown it. You do something wrong and there is a conviction, something on the inside of you said, man, that wasn't right. You were never taught that, but you just know it in your heart. It's because God has placed his imprint of standard and perfection in your life. And even if you numb it away or drink it away and, and face and run away from it, it still haunts you time to time. That's why the gospel is so good because we've all come short. We've all missed the mark. So what happens? Light came into our world. God stepped into our sinfulness, took upon our sin that he who knew no sin, did no sin, would now become sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God. The gospel is that the Jesus stands in the gap of God in us and intercedes and brings us to light. Even if you're a follower of Jesus and you missed the mark, you still face guilt. You know what to do, but yet there are pockets in our life that are dark. There's a sense of, I want to do it, I believe in it, but I still embrace, willfully embrace darkness and guilt stems from that. I want to say that not all guilt is legitimate guilt. Not all guilt is legitimate guilt. Sometimes there is a performance guilt where someone else or yourself places an unrealistic expectation. Hey, this is the way you have to perform and do things in sports or work or relationships. And when we miss that mark, we have a performance guilt. We feel like we felt it. That's not the kind of guilt that John is speaking of. Somehow, sometimes we have a psychological guilt. It's not from really actions or anything. It's just the state of mind is faulty. Our conscience is faulty. We feel like we just have this guilt hanging over us, and that's not the kind of guilt that John is speaking of. Sometimes we have a guilt from past forgiven sins. That's when 
We face guilt. We, we hear it. We, we can hear God speaking to us, and we've confessed it. We've taken it to the Lord, and he has already forgiven it, but yet it keeps haunting us. That is not, my friends, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That is a false accusation from Satan. That is an attack of the enemy when our forgiven sins are still being reminded of. How do you differentiate between a conviction of the Holy Spirit and an attack of the enemy? Number one, God will never convict you of past forgiven sins. Never. Why? Jeremiah says it like this in verse chapter, chapter 31, verse 34. I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. God says, if you've fessed up to it and you've confessed and repented of it, I will forgive your sins and remember them no more. It doesn't haunt you. It doesn't come after you. That has to be denounced as deception. There's no strings attached with God. He forgets and forgives. Number two, the Holy Spirit will only convict you of specific sins. It's not a general statement of why you feel bad or that there's no sense of I feel guilty and I don't know why. When God convicts you, he pinpoints the very thing where you missed the mark. Hey, you were not kind. That conversation, that was a lie. That was greedy. That was selfish. Why? You lost your temper and you shouldn't have. He convicts you of exactly where and how you missed the mark. And lastly, the Holy Spirit convicts us to bring peace and joy. Not condemnation, not an oversense, forever lagging of guilt. It's to bring joy, to bring life and forgiveness. And the beauty of God is to be restored through the Holy Spirit's conviction. Paul says it like this in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10. He says, godly sorrow, true conviction, godly remorse, godly guilt brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. No regret whatsoever. It leads to joy and freedom and the fullness of experiencing that. So if you're experiencing any guilt that is not that, that's not from God. You know, John is so smart. Uh, when he tells us what the problem of our guilt is, the sin issue that we face when we know what to do and don't do it, and we offend God and break his rule, he goes to exactly what we would do if we were to be guilty. You know, sometimes you tell somebody, hey, don't do this because I know you're going to do this. And you know exactly how they'll respond. There is a propensity about their life. There's an inclination of what they will do. So therefore, you just lay it out for them. Don't do this. John does the exact same thing. He says, look, when you face guilt, do not do this. These are the things that we're not to do with our guilt. 1 John 1, 6, 8, and 10 says this. If we claim to have fellowship with God... And yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we claim we have not sinned, we make God, him, to be a liar. And his word has no place in our lives. John mentions here three cover-ups, three false claims that we make when we face guilt. Don't we love covering up things? When you scratch a door, you're just trying to make sure nobody saw you and you move on. I remember a tragic day in my life where I gave myself a really bad haircut. I thought I was going to say something serious. Hey, I saw my brother giving himself a haircut. I saw my mom giving us a haircut. So she was like, hey, I'm going to this wedding this morning. I'm going to give myself a haircut. Bad idea. Very, very bad. So I get the trimmer out and I just start going on my sides and it's starting to look good. I get to the top and it doesn't look like it's doing much. So I just keep going and going and going and going. I take a shower, come out and realize the perfect circle of baldness right here in my head. Like right, just right there. I'm thinking, oh no, what do I do? Everyone's going to see this. I've got to cover this up somehow to bring the brilliant man I am. Went back to the trash can of the hair that I just cut. Putting it all out there, y'all. Put it out and sprinkled it on top of my head. There might or might not have been double-sided tape involved. I can't tell you. And I'm thinking, hey, I've covered it up. It's sealed, concealed. No one will know. If I just walk straight and don't bend, I'm good. Man, I got to tell you, I love breakfast, right? So I'm out of the shower and my mom makes my favorite breakfast, cinnamon toast, cinnamon toast crunch cereal bowl. I take my first scoop and all of it just falls into the plate. I learned a very spiritual lesson that day. Don't cover up a bad haircut. <laughs> Just don't cover it up. 
Don't cover up your sin because that's what we love to do. How can I band-aid this? How can I cover it up so no one will know? How can I move with life and never be noticed? Look at the first cover-up, the band-aid that John speaks of here. First, we are not to be lying to others. He says, look, when you sin, our first attempt is to be lying to others. If we claim to have fellowship with God and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. The easiest thing, the first attempt is to live a lie. Not even just to speak, but to live a lie. To pretend that that sin is not there. Hey, if I just, if I can just pretend, fake it till I make it, I'm good. No one will notice. I can just go on with life as normal. So on the outside, you are this wonderful person doing good things, living for God, claiming to know him. But on the inside, you are a very, very dark person. There's a discrepancy between who people see you to be and who you truly, 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 at the end of the night, you are. I think this is what drove Jesus crazy about the Pharisees. I mean, they claimed to be the closest people to God, but they were just whitewashed tombs. On the inside, there was no life. There was no purity. There was no right motive on why they did what they did. Maybe you've been living a lie to family members and spouses, children, hoping that if you can just make it till that moment where it goes away, it'll be fine, and it never does because our lies find us out eventually. Don't do that with our guilt. Maybe today is the day you remove some of the bandits and say, look, I'm going to come honest with my life. When that happens, it'll be the greatest joy of your life. Secondly, we try to cover up by lying to ourselves. Not just to others, we lie to ourselves. Hey, I can tell myself I'm 6'2 all day long, and I actually believe it. I can tell myself I look this way or do these things, and it internalizes within me. There's a sense of, hey, that is, you're right. Levin, you're right. You are 6'2. <laughs> this is what we do when we lie to ourselves. Listen, John says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. We deceive ourselves. We set up our own trial. And on our trial, there's three witnesses, three stands. One is our sin, our wrongfulness, rebellion against God. Second is other people's sin, how they've messed up. And third is our excuses, our reasons. So we look at our sin. Okay, I've done this. Yeah, it's pretty bad. But this person, so-and-so, has done a lot worse. They need to be confessing. They need to be in church this Sunday. I'm going to text them. Surely, my sin is not as bad as their sin, and we put our sin against theirs and say, hey, I'm okay. I'm actually really, really good. Boy, they need some help. Lastly, we say, hey, I've got some really good reasons for my sin. I was lonely, young, not sober. I was broke, didn't know any better. It was really the other person's fault. And if they had not done that to me, I wouldn't have done this. And so as we look at our trial of our sin and other people's sin and our reasons, we actually kind of feel good. Hey, I'm not that bad. Our reasons are good and other people's sins are worse. And so we let ourselves go off the trial. We're not guilty. We are deceiving ourselves. John says that little word there in the Greek is we are leading ourselves astray. The last cover up that we make with ourselves and others is that we are lying to God. Verse 10, if we claim that we have not sinned, we make God out to be a liar. And his word has no place in our life, in our lives. If we claim to have never sinned, hey, that's not a sin at all. We make God a liar. So in our perfect courtroom that we have, we add another stand. It's not just our sin or other people's sins or our reasons. Now we put God himself on trial. Hey, I know I've done this. But God, I don't think it's a sin. You didn't really mean that when you said that in Scripture, did you? It's not to be taken literally. It doesn't apply to me. It was written thousands of years ago to other people. Surely that's not covering me. I am exempt from that. And we creatively explain our rebellion and disobedience to God. We put God on trial. And so we know that God judges our sin as evil. We convince ourselves that his word doesn't apply and therefore we're free and we're not sinful so God must be a liar. Our culture has done a really good job of this recently. When it comes to many issues that are so clear in scripture, 
Let's take sexual sin for an example, something that applies to a large group of people, so prevalent and caters to an urge, a desire in our flesh. God says, don't commit adultery. But we make excuses in, in some form of sin. We justify. That word is pornea, meaning all sexual sin, all immorality, including cohabitation, premarital sex, when you're not in covenant with God and with another person. It means any affair or any physical intimacy with somebody that's not your spouse while you're married. But don't we justify our actions, our desires, our actions to meet our desires? God says don't kill, don't murder. But we've legalized it. We've justified it. And we've taken 58 million children in the last 40 years just in our country. All the while we're saying, God, you're a liar. That doesn't apply to us. I've got my own rules, my morality. Feels good. Everyone else is doing their army. So your word has no place in our life. When we do that, it's not just deception, it's blasphemy. This is what Proverbs says happens to us. Proverbs 28, verse 13. He who conceals his transgressions will not prosper. He who conceals his transgressions will not prosper. Prosper. That's talking about the well-being of your life. Your, your soul deteriorates. You say the statements like, it's killing me on the inside. It's eating me up because it really is. Sometimes it even has physical consequences. You carry that weight so long, you don't prosper. Every sin we uncover, God, every sin we cover, God will uncover. But every sin we uncover, God will cover with his mercy and love and grace. So what do we do with our guilt? You're here and you're saying, man, I, I, I feel that. I've been lying to myself. I've been lying to others. I've even lied to God about my sin, trying to hide it, make excuses, justifying it. What do we do? Is there any possibility to get out of this? Is there any way that I can be freed from guilt and shame and sin once and for all? Yes. First John 1, 9. If we confess our sins. He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let me read that again because it is so good and true. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Can I get an amen? Somebody, you believe that? So what's the solution? What unlocks the chains of guilt? What sets us free once and for all? It is our confession and God's faithfulness. That's it. When those two things are combined, you're free. Our confession and God's faithfulness. John has already told us God is light. In him there is no darkness. He is true. Meaning he is faithful to himself. Who he is will always be who he is. It is his nature to forgive us our sins when we confess. He has to do it, but not only does he have to or able to, he wants to. He longs for it. He planned out history so that he could forgive the sins of our life. What does it mean to confess? It means that we literally agree with God about what he says is sin. We agree with God. We don't make excuses. We don't cover it up. We say, God, you know what? You are right. I have fallen short of your standard. I have missed the mark. It's not a generalization of our sin to say, hey, maybe this is a sin. Would you just make it all right? No. It's in God, I'm giving you my sin. I'm giving you my guilt. I'm giving you where and how and when I've fallen short. And I trust you to forgive me because you're faithful. It's giving God, being an honest confessor, saying, God, this is my sin and I have offended you. It is saying what David said in Psalm 51, verse 4, Against you only, O God, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, and you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. God, you are right in your verdict and justified. It's not me ruling the court. It's not my rules that I'm breaking. It's your holy, perfect rule. And you are right when you judge. So we take our confession. We agree with God. But what he says is sin. But it's not just a verb or it's not just a word. It's not just an emotional feeling. Our confession is action. It's doing something about it. The verse in Proverbs that we read, 
chapter 28, verse 13, he says, He who conceals his transgression will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. Forsakes them. That's what repentance is. It's confection and action together. Repentance is if I'm going this way and I'm fast at it, there's a direction that I'm aiming towards and I have a conviction of the Holy Spirit in my heart. Repentance is a full turnaround of your body, soul, and mind towards the opposite direction. It is a forsaking of that and clinging on to this. Sometimes we're good at forsaking and repenting with just our minds and our heart. We feel sorry about it. We know that it's not right, but yet we continue to go the same way. That's not repentance. That is not a life change. Repentance has got to feel it in my heart, and my whole body now turns the opposite way and embraces your light and your truth. Confession is action. Why is confessing to God the only remedy? Why is trusting in his faithfulness the only key that unlocks guilt? You know, every religion, every system of life, every philosophy out there tries to get at this very issue. How do you receive forgiveness? How do you receive salvation? They, are, they have methods and philosophies and systems in place, things to do, things not to do, to receive forgiveness. But it is only the Christian faith that offers you not a system, but a person. It doesn't offer, say, hey, this is the way to have forgiveness, or this is what you've got to do. It offers you an actual person who steps into our time. And says, I don't just have a solution, I am the solution. I don't just prescribe something to you, hoping you'll do it or hoping you won't. But your solution is me, I'm it. John, the first uh, John writer, writes a, another book called The Gospel of John. And in that book, he writes about another man named John the Baptist. Confused yet? <laughs> John the Baptist wasn't called the Baptist because he was not Presbyterian or Lutheran or Methodist. He, he was called the Baptist because he was baptizing people. And he was one of the first to actually baptize people before Jesus. Until then, they would go and be ceremonially cleansed. They would go and dip themselves in a lake or a river to be cleansed. But John was actually himself baptizing. And so there would be large crowds of people that would come from all over Jerusalem, as John, the Gospel of John tells us in chapter 1. They would come to him seeking at least symbolically to be forgiven, seeking at least to feel like their sins were forgiven or this weight had been lifted off. Everyone would come to him. It says all of Jerusalem came to him. And this is what he says in John 1, verse 29. He says, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John looked at families and generations and people that had come far and near to be baptized by him, hoping for a removal of sin. He said, look, you've been looking at me. You've been trying. You've been putting all your efforts in this. But look, take the eyes off of me and this and look to the Lamb of God. For 1,500 years by now, people were offering their own lamb for sacrifice. They were trying to accomplish this forgiveness of sins by their own attempts and means and somehow to receive the sense of removing that guilt. But if it happened for 1,500 years, it means it didn't really work. But now John says, look to the lamb of God. That word there is the lamb that God has sent. He is a better lamb. He is a better solution. He is a better means, and he is the only way that you can have eternal life. He is the only one that has overcome, that has rendered sin defeated, and has paid the price. And so he says, look to the lamb that God has sent that takes away the sin of the world. That's what they have been longing for. That's what you and I long for. Who will take away my sin? That little Greek word there, to take away sin, means to lift up carry off to lift up and simply carry off you feel the weight of guilt you feel the chains of guilt that sense of remorse is eating up inside of you and your question my question generations have asked this question who will lift us up who will carry it away look at the lamb of god who takes away the sin of the world. You feel indebted and you've done something you know you shouldn't have done. 
fail to do what is right, actions didn't meet your belief, you feel like, I owe it to myself to not have done that. I owe it to that person not to have done that. I owe it to God to not have done that. And I feel indebted. I can't pay it back. The Lamb of God who lifts and takes it away. Paul says it like this in Colossians 2, verse 13 and 14. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, lifted up, carried it away, nailing it to the cross. He's made us alive. We feel dead on the inside. We feel guilty. He says, God has made you alive, forgiven your sins. To forgive sins means to let it all go, release it. How does God forgive? Completely, perfectly, daily. So what 1 John says, he purifies us from all unrighteousness so that we might have light and walk in the fellowship of Jesus. The very stain of your sin, the very defilement, the unrighteousness of your sin, he lifts and carries off. So when you're looking for a new slate and a fresh start in the sense of washing away, God says, only I can do that. You might have temporary numbness and other things by other means, but only I can purify even the very stain, the memory of your sin. What do we do with those memories? What do we do when we drive through that city and hear that name and the holidays come around and we feel guilty? The marks of guilt now become marks of grace. Memories of guilt and sin now become memories of grace and forgiveness, God's faithfulness. They have now become the highlight of God's incredible, unconditional offer to you for free life, for fullness of life, eternal life. So when you drive through that city and hear that name or whatever it may be for you that's associated with your sin, let it be a highlight. Let it be a reminder. Instead of drowning in your sorrow and your guilt, lift your hands to God and say, thank you, God, for taking away my sin and redeeming me from the pit of hell and my dead condition that I was in and giving me the newness and the fullness of life. The only difference between Simon Peter and Judas Iscariot, both sinned, both rebelled against God, but Simon confessed and was reunited to Jesus. Judas hid and took his own life. That's the only difference. Simon became one of the greatest ministers, preachers of the gospel because he confessed. That's why I love the song we sang, you can use me again, Lord. The tragedy of guilt, it breaks, hinders fellowship with God. The great reward of confession is it brings you back to fellowship, intimacy, a right standing with God. See, so uh, close this morning, you know, this afternoon, I want you to respond. Simply agree with God what he says about your sin. Be specific. I mean, you can think of things right now, things you've said, things you've done, things you wish you had done. Greed, loneliness, whatever it might be. Say, God, I agree with you that that is my sin. And when you confess it to the Lord, he forgives completely. There's no more remorse, no more guilt. It's done away with. He's lifted it up and carried it away. Maybe it's been a long journey, and there's one thing that's been paralyzing you. As you notice on your response card, communication card, join Celebrate Recovery. Join a group of people who are in recovery, experiencing freedom together. Sometimes you need community around you to pray with you, to love on you, not to judge you, but to push you towards the freedom that God has placed in front of you. Would you respond to that? I want to ask you about your heads and... Really, I don't want you to look at this talk and this message and God's word. And Well, that applies to somebody else. It, it doesn't apply to me. I don't have any guilt. I mean, I'm okay. I really search your heart. Is there any pocket where it's not light? It's not God's light and it's dark. Is there any place where you're enchained? Maybe a thought, maybe a habit, maybe past, future, Whatever it might be, would you look past and say, man, I, I'm not that person. God is offering me salvation and freedom. When you pray a prayer of confession, you are applying what God has made available to the whole world to yourself. You're owning, you say, I want that. And you're applying that to yourself, what God has made available to the whole world. Maybe you, this is your first time in church in a long time and somebody dragged you here, offered you lunch, breakfast. 
But you're here because God says, let me just give you a new slate. You've been working hard trying to clean it up yourself. The issue is dip- deeper and, and affects more than you think. You have the chance this morning to say, God, I give you my life. I want a new slate. I want a new beginning. I want a fresh start where there's no guilt and no condemnation or shame. God embraces you with his grace and love. So today is a day of your salvation and a new beginning. Finally, it's been lifted up and carried away. Let's pray. God, we bring our sin to you, our guilt, because we so love you and want fellowship with you. We're not willing to compromise fellowship with you, eternal life with you for the sake of our sin. We want peace with God. We want fellowship with God. So in this moment, would you be honored and glorified in our response in this honest confession of joining God, agreeing with God, and receiving forgiveness where you've taken away our guilt forever. All we've got to do is agree with you. I'm guilty, but you're faithful. Here's my confession. In Jesus' name. Amen.